Frank, how did the Mothers of Invention come about? You mean the name? Because the record company refused to have a group on the label called the Mothers. They had talked to some uh, people with marketing expertise and had ascertained that the American public would refuse to deal with a group called the Mothers. So I had to have of invention on the end of it. Otherwise, they wouldn't give us a record contract. How did the band come together? Um, by accident. Okay. <laughs> Let me go on to a different topic then. That's good. Okay. <laughs> If there's any of these questions you don't want to answer, you just let me know. Believe me, I will. Okay. Who were some of your major musical influences? There's a list of 160 names on the inside of the Freak Out album. Since the time the Freak Out album was released 20 years ago, I think I might have added four more names to the list. The names are influences, both, both positive and negative. I'm easily influenced by things I hate. Are you as easily influenced by things you like? Yeah but there's more stuff that I hate than stuff that I like. What songs of yours do you feel show you at your best? That's a matter of taste. My favorites are probably the ones that make everybody else vomit, but uh, I like things like Dangerous Kitchen and Jazz Discharge Party Hats. Can you describe... Or the radio is broken. Can you describe the rock scene in L.A. in the 60s, 70s, and then what you think of it today in the 80s? In the 60s, the rock scene in Los Angeles was kind of interesting. The uh, sociology of it is kind of strange. Everybody was more interested in dressing up than playing music, so you had uh, rampant costumery all over the place. And the only, time, the only type of music that was successful in Los Angeles during the 60s was folk rock, everything that was birds derived or derived from a group called Love, which was also a big group in L.A. at the time. There was little, literally no market for anything with a blues bass influence. It was all this uh, flower power stupidity. And then into the 70s, uh, it got vague. The scene in Los Angeles dissipated, so there wasn't really any focus to it. It was just a, a major record manufacturing center, and anything that you could stick on a record that would uh, sell is what people came to Los Angeles to do. And the 80s is an extension of that. Somebody figured out that because you could dress in a different costume and do punk music, they could have a punk scene in Los Angeles. So that developed, and you had people coming from all over the country who could probably play an instrument before they got there. But as soon as they got to Los Angeles, they forgot all of their chops, made themselves as ugly as possible, figuring that was the best way to get a record contract. And uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> Do you think that music, music today, not, not just in L.A., rock and roll music in general, is, is more formula than it was, say, in the 60s? Absolutely. Do you think there's any, uh, any feeling left I in mean, music? You here on MTV should know about formula music. Come on, give me a break. I mean, let's face it. We are talking mass formulation. Going from there, let's go into another question. What do you think about music video in general? Well, first of all, it's a bad deal for the artist because record companies expect the artist to pay for the video itself. A video with class costs about $150,000. An entire album costs $150,000. That's 30 minutes of music roughly for $150,000 that you can listen to or four minutes of stuff that you can watch for $150,000 the artist is expected to pay for that out of his potential royalties or out of cash out of his own pocket. This video after it is manufactured is then sent to places like MTV. MTV puts it on the air, charges advertisers time. They make a profit from uh, selling commercial time. This money does not go to the artist. The artist is supposed to take the risk and take the flyer on this thing to promote his record with a video and the video outlets receive all of their programming material free of charge. This is not a good deal for the artist, and it's something that should be corrected. Aside from that, videos saturate very quickly. You can look at a video six times, and even if it's a fabulous video, you've seen everything that's in there, and you don't need to see it again. You're waiting for the next video that has the girl getting out of the car, uh, midgets, uh, chains, stuff in the ear, stuff in the face, you know, weird hair, clothes, light coming at a weird angle, zippers. You, you've seen it and you're ready for the next one. A record that relates to something that you feel inside, you can listen to hundreds of times, 
and it means something to your life. Videos are disposable. They're as disposable as television commercials. In fact, that's what they are. They're four-minute television commercials for albums. And when you consider that a record company makes the bulk of the profit on a record, the artist does not. And you have a modern situation where the artist is being asked to not only bankroll the video and the uh, income of the station that plays the video, he's also bankrolling the record company. This stinks. Have you ever, though, seen a music video that you liked or could appreciate? Yes, my favorite music video is Genius of Love by Tom Tom Club, because it's animated and it's clever. We're, the show that, that we're doing right now for MTV, we're, we're doing a series on, on different things that have influenced rock and roll music. And, and we're doing an hour show right now on progressive rock. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, it might take us an hour to try to define what progressive rock is. No one, no one seems to have been able to. Do you have a definition for it? Well, I would say that the general definition, and it's not mine, but I would presume that pe people would accept this definition. Progressive rock is anything that doesn't sound like regular rock. Regular rock is everything that sounds like itself. All songs which sound the same. Everything on MTV, everything on the radio, that's rock. Progressive rock is stuff that doesn't sound like that. Some of the bands that we're going to be highlighting, Frank, in this show are, are Procol Harum and Traffic and Pink Floyd and Jethro Tull and Genesis and ELP and, yes, King Crimson, Devo. Obviously, in, in, in talking about you do, you, do you have any comments on any of these bands? Are you is that progressive rock? Well? I wouldn't say so. <laughs> You'd consider none of these bands progressive rock? Name them again, and I'll go through them. Procol Harum? No. Traffic? No. Pink Floyd? Sometimes. Jethro Tull? Sometimes. Genesis? Sometimes. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer? Sometimes. Yes? Sometimes. King Crimson? Sometimes. Devo? No. Why? I wouldn't describe Devo as progressive rock. You? I wouldn't describe myself as progressive rock either. How would you In describe fact, it? a lot of times it's not even rock and roll at all. It just happens to be consumed by a rock and roll audience. Do you think that you, you as a musician, have had any influence on any of the bands that we just, the list that we just went through? It's always a possibility. Can you, if you, if you had to, or if I asked you to, and if you chose to answer the question, could you sum up Frank Zappa in a few sentences? Which one? Frank Zappa, the... The industrial strength uh, Frank Zappa? The industrial strength Frank Zappa. Uh, I'm a person who uh, likes to do what he wants to do and has worked at it for 20 years and can generally do what he wants to do, whether people like it or not. And what I do is design for people who like it, not for people who don't. And I have no desire to inflict it on people who don't want to consume it. And I'm committed to turning out as much of it as possible for the people who like it. It's there if you like it. If you don't like it, there's all those other names on the list. What a great attitude. That's neat. Do it's you called rational thinking. <laughs> so few people be, seem to be able to do it. Yeah, I know. It was phased out with the Republican administration. Frank, do you recall playing on the bill with any groups or artists that you've really admired or liked? Uh, well, we have had quite a long list of uh, opening acts, but uh, I don't want to be placed in the position of being a music critic. I mean, for example, some of the people who have opened for us have included Fleetwood Mac, uh, Chicago, um, Alice Cooper, uh, Three Dog Night, a lot of groups that went on to be uh, mainstays of rock and roll. But I'm not a rock and roll consumer. I don't listen to the radio, and the only time I see MTV is if my kids are watching it. I mean, occasionally I have glanced at it and recoiled in horror at some of the things that I've seen on there. But that's just my own personal taste. You know, I'm not a rock and roll consumer. What sort of musical consumer are you, Frank? Uh, I carry around tapes with me, traveling on the road. I listen to Bulgarian folk music, uh, Chopin, uh, Purcell, Webern, Stravinsky, Howlin' Wolf, 
you know, I like a lot of different kinds of stuff, but basically it's not uh, rock and roll music. Can you describe how uh, John Lennon came to perform with you at the Fillmore? No problem. A journalist knocked on my door at um, a hotel called One Fifth Avenue at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the day of that uh, show. And he was, he was waiting there at the door. This man writes for the Village Voice. He was waiting there at the door with a tape recorder in his hand. And, you know, I just crawled out of bed, my hair sticking out all over the place, and you know, my eyes were twirling like that. Two o'clock in the afternoon is very early to wake up if you played two shows in a night. And he says, hi, Frank. I'd like to introduce you to John Lennon. And he was you know, sticking the mic at me like, oh, I'm going to go eek, or something like that. So I said, OK, come in. And the first thing he said to me is, you're not as ugly as I thought you'd be. Which leads me to wonder about the strength of his glasses, because uh, I'm as ugly as uh, I ever was. I'm just as ugly now as I was then. And it's a great credit to Mr. Lennon that he wasn't shocked by all of this. So he came in, and um, we talked for a few minutes, and I asked him whether he wanted to play with us at the uh, concert at the Fillmore East that night, and he did. And we just happened to have a recording truck there, because we were recording the shows for another purpose, and the tapes were made. Now, here's the bad part. During the performance when Lennon was on stage with Yoko, we played one of my songs called King Kong. And the deal that was made according to uh, the usage of the tapes was he got to use the tapes for his purpose, I got to use the tapes for my purpose. He released part of that performance on an album called Sometime in New York and changed the name of the song King Kong to Jam Rag and gave himself and Yoko writing and publishing credit on the song. Now, obviously, this song has a melody and chord changes. Somebody did write it, and it was not them. So, whoops. Ooh. Did you ever do anything about it? Um, not yet. It's so hard not to laugh. Go ahead and laugh. What's the difference? <laughs> see, see what MTV does to you? You can't laugh. You have to sit there and take this stuff seriously. Give yourself and the audience a break. Would you? I mean, are we to assume that MTV really is an extension of the Warner Brothers mentality? It is, isn't it? Come on, be honest. It's that corporate Warner <laughs> Brothers, come on, we're sort is. of out there in the valley kind of mentality, isn't it? There's I mean, no doubt about it. I know it. They may call it rock and roll, but it's corporate America. That's right. It's oh. push the button, pull the chain, out comes the little brown choo-choo train. <laughs> Frank, who are your guitar heroes? Well, today my favorite is Alan Holdsworth. Uh, but when I first started playing, um, I like Johnny Guitar Watson, Clarence Gatemouth Brown, and Guitar Slim. And the style that I play right now probably is more lin linearly derived from what Guitar Slim used to do than anything else. Do you consider yourself a great guitarist? Well, I'm specialized. What I do on the guitar has uh, very little to do with what other people do on the guitar. Most of the other guitar solos that you hear performed on stage have been practiced over and over and over again. They go out there and they play the same one every night, and it's really just spotless. My theory is this. I have a basic mechanical knowledge of the operation of the instrument, and I got an imagination. And when the time comes up in the song to play a solo, it's me against the laws of nature. I don't know what I'm going to play. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know roughly how long I have to do it. And it's a game where you have a piece of time and you get to decorate it. And depending on how intuitive the rhythm section is, it's backing you up. You can do things that are literally impossible to imagine sitting here. But you can see them performed uh, before your very eyes in, in a live performance situation. I don't like any of the guitar solos that have ever been released on a record. And I think that uh, the real fun of playing the guitar is doing it live, not freezing it and saving it on a piece of plastic someplace or putting it on a video. So every night then is spontaneous for you, huh? Absolutely. It keeps it fun? Well, think of it the other way. You know, what if you had to play exactly the same notes every night? Isn't that like punching a clock? Mm hmm Well, who needs that crap? Again, I mean, you know, I'll make a statement. 
that I made to one of your earlier statements, it's so refreshing to hear somebody talk like that. Well, most people won't take that chance because I'll take the chance to go out there and make a mistake. I will take that chance for the privilege of doing something unique, one time only, live in front of an audience because that's, that's one of the reasons why the audience has come to see the concerts over and over again for the last 20 years because they know that the concert, even though you may be playing songs off the record, is a unique situation. It's only going to happen that one time. There are going to be uh, jokes happening on stage that relate to that particular audience, and there are going to be solos played during that show that will never happen again. Have never happened before, will never happen again. So it's something special just for the people who bought the tickets to that show. And it's probably one of the reasons why the bootlegs of uh, these concerts have done so well over the last couple of decades. There's just there's hundreds of the things out, and that must be one of the reasons why people buy them, although you shouldn't buy them. Do you think, Frank, that most artists are just afraid to stretch themselves musically, afraid to take any sort of a chance at all? Well, MTV is helping with that syndrome because all video outlets, and that's basically the focus of the music business today, is you know, whether or not what you do is video acceptable. Let's, let's look at it realistically. If a person likes music, that is not enough in the 80s. You can like music and you can play music. You can sing, you can dance, you can have all these things going for you, but you're not even going to get to first base unless you have science fiction hair and diagonal zippers on your clothes. Forget it. You go to a record company to make a deal and the first thing they're gonna do is look at your publicity picture. If they don't like that, they won't even listen to the tape. In fact, they don't even care about the tape because they can always get Trevor Horn to fix it. And so after Trevor has fixed it and they've approved your publicity photo, then you get the video treatment and everything gets formulated according to the Warner Brothers aesthetic. It goes on to MTV and it goes on to any other competitor that hasn't been bought by MTV yet. And the group gets exactly one chance to do one thing. And their um, musical lifespan is in direct proportion to the interest that the audience has in the way they look because the whole thing is based on a visual merchandising. So what happened to music? What do you, what do you think it'll take to, uh, to get us a, back to a point where music is music and experimental and people are willing to take chances? Well, it's not going to happen. Really? Think, yeah, that's think, sad. Well, that's, that's a frightening thought. Tough tuck us. The damage has been done. And unless somebody uh, realizes, and, they, and it has to be admitted, and it has to be advertised and supported on this medium, that what you are seeing on MTV is merely advertising for product, which was designed as product, not as music, only as product. The song is written so it's a visual song. A guy sits down and he figures it out, how many midgets can we get in here? How many girls? How many lip close-ups? When do you take the glasses off and the water comes out of your face? You know, you figure it all out, and then that's your product. And that is not writing a piece of music. Do you think, do you think that people are, who are entering the music business today are more concerned about being rock and roll stars than musicians? Do you think that's part of the problem? That's, well, that's not part of the problem. That's the way the world really is. Uh, there's very few people who ever went into pop music who did it because they went into it as an art form. They did it because they wanted to be a star. There is a strong desire to be famous, to be rich, to have all the cocaine you want to stick up your nose, have a chainsaw to chop up your hotel room, and naked girls running around with, you know, leather things with points on their wrist and stuff. That's what everybody wants, you know? And they should have that. They should just get it out of my face. <laughs> but they should have as much of it as they want. That's got nothing to do with music. 